Good day and welcome to Medicine and Health with Dr. Paul Anderson. That's me. I am Dr. Paul. And today, uh, if you're listening live, uh, this would be November 4th, 2021. And we have some things today in this uh, sort of Q&A session that may be very, um, you know, date, time and date dependent because we're going to talk a little bit about COVID and some other stuff. Uh, so in case you're wondering, it's early November 2021. So if you're listening in the future, all bets may be off. But I got a lot of uh, feedback and questions, et cetera, from people who were curious about some updates, uh, also had some sort of, I think, follow-up type of questions about some of the immune things that we've talked about in the past, et cetera. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to take a look at what the questions were. We can go back over them maybe take a fresh look at the information, et cetera. So one of the things uh, that I wanted to do, so I didn't want this to be all you know, about COVID and pandemics, but obviously we have done a lot of shows on that and get a lot of questions about it as well. Um, but one of the questions that came up because I did that series of three updates around the Delta variant, kind of where it was going and all that. Um, and, People uh, realized, you know, we, that was sort of reporting as it was happening. And we, we were, if you recall, looking at a lot of the UK data as far as how Delta went for them, because it was there earlier uh, than it was in North America. And <clears throat> their, uh, you know, medical and social structure is similar to ours in North America. So we felt that would be a good uh barometer to look at. Well, what do we know now that we're, you know, uh, weeks and weeks and weeks away from all of that? So the first question I thought I would tackle is what happened with Delta? What happened with the surge in Delta? Uh, and things that we were told to be concerned about, like children, etc. Well, um, what happened in the US was largely what, you know, most of us who were who had been looking at uh, the United Kingdom and their sort of trajectory with Delta happened pr pretty much what happened here. So what a lot of us were saying back then is if it's like the UK, Delta is more transmissible, but apparently less pathogenic, less dangerous. And so you're going to get a bigger transmission curve on a broader group of people, meaning younger people than before, et cetera. And in doing that, you're going to have this initial surge of numbers that are going to go way up, and you're going to have more, you know, previously not as commonly hospitalized people get hospitalized, like little children, uh, and uh, people who maybe, you know, would have, you know, missed on the first go around younger folks. So that kind of came to pass, that was sort of the thing. It's more transmissible, it's less deadly, so we get more cases. And so initially you had a lot of reporting going on, some of which was shown to be inaccurate, which happens early on in stuff. But you had a lot of initial reporting that, oh my God, the, you know, the, the hospitals are now full of children and there's no room for children and all this stuff. And while in certain local instances that would very much be true, uh, what most of us were saying who were trying to model based on what had already happened was, you know, that will happen because it's infecting younger people. And if you get sick younger people, which there are, uh, then you're going to wind up with more of them and, you know, in the hospital and that happened. But then what we also said is it's going to sort of go to a broader group and kind of spread. And then the numbers will dampen down. Now, for instance, in India, which is another place where Delta hit earlier, um, you know, they went from something on the order of 400,000 cases a day, kind of at the peak ish, you know, almost half a million uh, down to, you know, under 40,000 uh, and, and I believe even lower. So, you know, those sort of things um, did kind of come to pass with Delta. Now, are we still having a Delta, you know, kind of wave and surge? Are there other um, 
you know, are there other uh, variants, you know, all along the way and all of that? Well, we're still dealing with the uh, easy transmission of Delta, et cetera. And now what we're starting to see is um, something being characterized as Delta plus. And so it's uh, kind of on the heels of the initial Delta surge and, you know, what's going on with that, et cetera. So the next um, question kind of leads into some other deeper types of questions. Um, so I, I'll try and kind of cluster these together here. Um, <coughs> so with respect to, you know, the, the pandemic as it is, Delta and Delta Plus, but overall the pandemic and, and humanity moving forward, you know, are there any people modeling a trajectory for that? Well, what I think we have to come to grips with is uh, when you get a new um, uh, updated version of an old virus <clears throat> into humans or any other population, that virus is now going to be part of, of the human virome, okay? meaning we're going to encounter it either seasonally or periodically, et cetera. Some viruses uh, are a little easier to contain and uh, easier to know when they're you know, starting off and all of that. And so things get isolated better like SARS-CoV-1, the original SARS. Um, SARS-CoV-2, on the other hand, has this very disparate, you know, um, very individualized experience when each person gets it. And a lot of people don't know they're sick for a while and they're spreading the virus. And so that's how a virus like SARS-CoV-2 can kind of keep going. Now, what most people that I, I've listened to either that, you know, used to work for CDC or some place where they, you know, they study these things um, is the idea of SARS-CoV-2 being extinguished and going away is that's not likely to happen. That's just not part of our future. It's going to become something like, you know, the uh, annual variations of cold and flu that go around uh, in the world. <clears throat> and so you, there will never be a time probably where you're not going to deal with SARS-CoV-2. Will it be at pandemic levels? No, it'll be, you know, a lot like uh, the influenza pandemic of a hundred years ago, was an actual pandemic and then it tapered off and then that strain of the flu comes up periodically, et cetera. So what most people are modeling is that we're going to go, you know, kind of from this pandemic waves to endemic waves <clears throat> to then just a recirculating sort of uh, part of our viral challenge that, that we get to. Now, if you look at that and you look at, well, okay, we, we kind of were trying to model on say the UK with Delta, what was gonna happen here, pretty much what a lot of us were saying is big bloom, more people uh, infected, more people in the hospital, then it's gonna kind of, kind of go away. Uh, that's basically what's going on. So then what's going on now with Delta Plus uh, that we're seeing and herd immunity and all of that? Well. One of the things that you want to keep in mind with global immunity, uh, if you want to call it herd immunity, et cetera, just the immunity of the human population in this case to something, is to consider that you have two groups of immune triggers generally. Okay. So the idea of herd immunity is, is once you have a new infectious agent, in the beginning, you don't have any resistance because no one's really had it. <clears throat> and then it starts to mutate, which again is what viruses do. And we get variants and all that stuff. But as it churns its way through the population, eventually you build up bigger and bigger amounts of immunity for it. And so in modern times, there's two ways to build up immunity. So one is uh, was sort of the old standby, which is past exposure, or past infection. And we've, we've done other programs on past infection. And so you can go back and you can look at uh, COVID T and B cell immunity on, on my YouTube channel if you want. Uh, but, but let me just kind of go through it real quick here because past infection has a two track triggering of immune memory. 
so if I get infected with something, I am going to have certain cells that are going to take a sampling of that infectious material or the cells that are in or some combination thereof. And they're going to present that as an antigen, as a potential bad guy to my immune system. And then my immune system is going to go through uh, its two main phases, being the cell mediated side, the T cell side, like T like Thomas, cell mediated immunity. And that's where I'm going to make some actual cells that are killer T cells that go and uh, kill this particular antigen material. And then I'm going to make on my B cell side, the antibody or humoral immunity side, I'm going to make antibodies. So instead of killer T cells, I'm going to go and make antibodies. Now, if we just look at one side or the other, what we see is in most of the research that we have durable uh, immunity, but some of the uh, studies that only looked at, say, the antibody immunity, humoral immunity, uh, became concerning uh, with what they're reporting, saying, well, in some people, the antibodies stay high, some people, the antibodies go down. But then some other follow-up studies were done around that, around T cells and COVID, that showed that even if your antibodies, memory antibodies went down, your T cell memory, because there's a whole branch of T cells uh, that are for memory purposes, stayed high. And the cool thing about the way that the immune system works is that either a B cell memory response or a T cell memory response can reactivate the other side. So if I'm weak here, I can have a response here and reactivate my memory response on the weak side. Uh, and so we do need to keep in mind that, you know, to, to the best science that we have that's, you know, looking at uh, both T and B cell activity, if you have had COVID of any type, you're very, very uh, likely to have immunity that is persistent. Now, you also can get uh, immunity through immunization, hence the name. And um, one of the things that's been happening, especially since Delta, is uh, this idea of breakthrough infection. So let's just first take, okay, herd immunity is, I get the mass of people who've either had the virus have been exposed and developed immune response, or you know had some artificial immune response like a vaccine. And the bigger that population gets, then the, the less people are likely to get it out here, uh, even in the non-herd immune setting. But with Delta and then Delta Plus, one of the things that we've seen happening is not only more people and younger people being infected with uh, COVID-19, but also um, breakthrough infections, which are, okay, I had my immunizations, let's say for the sake of argument, you know, person had two, you know, Pfizer, two Moderna or whatever, and um, they're supposed to be good to go, okay? Then what happens is the person gets exposed to COVID, usually Delta, Delta plus something like that, and uh, they wind up developing COVID. And you think, well, how does that happen? Because they're immunized against <laughs> this, uh, this viral agent. Well, one of the things that we're seeing, especially with the more transmissible strains like Delta, <clears throat> is it's easier for a more transmissible strain to get around through the population. Well, according to, again, these are usually virologists who used to uh, work at CDC or work at CDC. Um, so try and kind of go to as many source experts as possible for this sort of thing. But what they generally say about these breakthrough infections is if you think about the way that those immunizations, the ones we have right now, okay, uh, you know, like Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, those, those guys, <clears throat> they're, they create a response. Uh, we have injected them, this direct sort of uh, paraphrasing of one of, one of the CDC people said, you inject it into the person uh, so it doesn't go through the respiratory system like a lot of these viruses do. But what happens then is you inject it into the person, it creates an immune response in the Ig, the, the antibody side, IgM, and then IgG for memory. M is more acute, and you turn it into IgG for memory. Well, IgG and IgM are great then when you get exposed to it, except 
the initial response you have in your respiratory system is not IgM or G generally, it's IgA like Alice. And so if I haven't developed any IgA, I am not going to block it when it comes in. So I'm going to get exposed to COVID, let's say Delta or Delta Plus or whatever, Epsilon, and I'm immunized. It's going to go in here where the IgA is supposed to be protecting. It's going to fulminate in my respiratory system. And you recall the, you know, after uh, one of the breakouts, they were looking, uh, CDC looked at, you know, swabbing people with and without vaccine, and they're just about the same amount of viral load. Um, and so then I get it, even though I'm vaccinated, and it takes my body, you know, a while to recognize that the infection is there, and then to create an IgM and an IgG response against it. So there's a delay. So that's what you see with the breakthrough infection. So the people, in my experience in our community, I'm you know, kind of monitoring a bunch of people with breakthrough infections. And um, it's, it's like, you know, it's like regular COVID. There's, there's a, a, a very big gradient of what happens. Some people, it's, you know, the kind of classic loose smell or taste and they're fatigued and achy and they're kind of better around a week. Uh, some people are two or three weeks into a pretty bad sore throat and a cough and, you know, more like cold and flu symptoms. Um, but the delay there in um, I'm immunized, but I still got the disease is that the triggers that my immune system have from the immunization take time to, to catch up to a respiratory transmitted disease, which SARS-CoV-2 generally is. So that's the idea behind a breakthrough infection. So will that person then uh, be more immune? Yes, generally, uh, you know, if you get somebody has a breakthrough infection and uh, they've already been immunized, then they develop all of, you know, their native uh, immune response. They probably have a, a, a very uh, rigorous uh, sort of immune response in the future. But one of the things that most of the people looking at modeling and looking at other places you know, like Israel or uh, the UK, these are all kind of on news stories you can go hunting for. But um, if you're looking at, you know, this pattern, this idea of breakthrough COVID infection in the already immunized population is uh, happening everywhere where they've done the immunizations, basically. So this is not just the United States or Canada, for example. Now, some other things to consider then is, so is there, is there a benefit? There's kind of two follow-ups to this. One is, is there a benefit uh, then if I'm already, you know, immunized and then I'm already going to, you know, maybe get a breakthrough infection. What, what am I doing here? You know, is, is there a benefit there? Um, and then the second question really is, um, okay, so how reliable are the, you know, the numbers uh, that we look at as, you know, as we look at, okay, you know, native immunity is worth this much and, and uh, uh, vaccine immunity worth this much, et cetera. Well, to the first question, um, when you're looking at, you know, breakthrough infections and, um, you know, is like, is that going to kind of keep going on, et cetera? Um, based on what we're seeing everywhere else in the world, probably so. So what a lot of people choose to do is then kind of go back to uh, environmental controls like masking and all that business. Um, is a breakthrough infection as bad as a, as a regular coded infection if you're not immunized? We have some data kind of that shows, yes, uh, some experiential data shows maybe, maybe not. A lot of it depends on who you are and how, uh, you know, how sick you got. Um, so, you know, like I said, I've seen breakthrough infections be days to one week, and I've seen them go on for three weeks with pretty severe symptoms. Uh, so it's very dependent on the person. Now, generally speaking, are you less likely to go to the hospital with a breakthrough infection? Yeah, you're less likely to be hospitalized with, uh, with a post-vaccine breakthrough infection. If you've already had COVID, uh, you are also very unlikely to need to be hospitalized as well. So in that case, kind of both sides are about the same. Um, in regard to numbers, and, and you know, this kind of goes to some things I've seen, you know, people 
uh, on on social media like to kind of ping pong back and forth. Um, I would say idea sharing. Uh, usually it's one person talking out and the other person kind of talking out and either listening to each other. Um, but you see things shared, you know, about, well, uh, natural immunity is a complete myth. Okay, so I saw this uh, shared by someone uh, and there was uh, one paper and the paper did a review and it looked at very particular parts of immune memory and not other parts of immune memory. And uh, if you look at it that way, you could say, well, yeah, nobody would ever have natural immunity to anything. Uh, but to then take that paper that's uh, somewhat, you know, skewed, it's giving you an outcome, you know, that they were aiming for, um, that doesn't match other papers. Uh, it, it's a little bit of a stretch to say, well, see, there is no natural immunity. It doesn't last. Uh, you, you can't, you know, base statements on that just on, you know, one paper that was set up to give you a particular answer, although people are doing it. So, um, I do want to be clear that, you know, natural immunity, if you've already had COVID, is, is generally pretty strong. Now, the other follow-up then is, well, what about boosters or boosters for people who have natural immunity, et cetera? Um, and can we trust those numbers? Well, one of the people I saw reporting said, well, if you already had COVID and you get a single booster, you'll have super immunity. Well, maybe, you know, maybe not. Um, what appears is if you're stacking immune triggers and you have, let's say you already been immunized, then you got COVID. So you have breakthrough COVID on top of your immunization. Those people probably do have some, you know, very robust sorts of immunity. Same on the side of the person who already had COVID is adding another uh, layer, you know, by doing um, a, a booster shot or an added shot onto a post-COVID patient, is that going to help them? Uh, early, early data again say, yeah, you're stacking immune uh, support um, and immune triggering. Can we extrapolate that to say that's gonna last forever or it's always gonna be true as we get new numbers? No. And the reason I say that is there's a lot of people throwing around numbers, oh, this is X percent effective and this is X you know, percent uh, side effects and, and all this stuff. The numbers are so early, it's really nice to see numbers, but you need to remember that they, they change over time. So I was just reading earlier before I came on to do this and um, you know, there was a therapeutic that had been reported to be you know, super uh, you know, helpful like in the high 90 percentile. And then they were showing, you know, well, after we've done, you know, a few more million of these, it's, it's not not quite 95, it's, it's down to 72%. And, and that's not to say it, that's not still on the winning side of a therapeutic, but it's to say that if we just went with the early numbers and said, see, it's 98% effective, those aren't going to stay real forever. That's how numbers are. The more we have to put in, the more we have to put into the mass of data that you look at, usually the more realistic the numbers get over time. And so um, while it's nice to speculate and we can look at things and look at trends, um, I don't think that we can use the data that we have right now to say, it's, you know, this is for sure, you know, always going to uh, uh, perform at this level, for example. Um, so another question, um, that was asked uh, that was, I, I think, related because we've also talked about what, you know, are the things you can take for your immune system to, you know, make it perform uh, at a good level, et cetera. And um, so someone uh, wrote in a question that said, <laughs> I've been taking zinc, uh, vitamin A, D, and K, vitamin C uh, for, <laughs> for 14 months now. Is there any danger with that? Um, and I, I suppose. I mean, starting very early on, you know, I did a number of podcasts on nutrients for immunity and herbs and other stuff. And, uh, you know, many, many other people have. So a lot of people sort of, you know, some people already taken the same, you know, that stuff. Uh, some people sort of looked and they never really taken supplements before. So they went out and they just bought this list and start taking it. Uh, I did a newsletter, um, which you can get on my website, uh, dranow.com, D-R-A-N-O-W.com on uh, you know, immune supportive nutrients and research behind that and stuff. 
But this is a really good, I think, safety and follow-up question, which is this is something we talked about, you know, almost two years ago now. It's, it's hard to believe, but um, and that is that there is a difference if you're using nutrients to support your immunity uh, beyond your diet. So if you're eating things, that's, that's fine. That's diet stuff. But if you're taking supplements, a pill that has vitamin A or D or whatever in it, um, there's a difference between doing something for a couple of months to help you over cold and flu season and doing something every day for one year, two years, 10 years, et cetera. So the difference is you can uh, safely usually get away with higher doses of things for a short period of time. And what I tended to say in those early days of, you know, 2020, we we're doing all these uh, programs about immune support and can you really support your immune system? What nutrients might do it, et cetera. What I used to tell people was, look, you know, for one, two, three, four months, all of these doses are going to be fine because your, you know, your body is going to have purpose for them, et cetera. And if it's a water soluble uh, item, you know, you'll probably equilibrate and you pee out what you don't need. But there are some things like fat soluble nutrients and certain minerals that might imbalance other minerals that would be really good to take a fresh look at. And so in this person's case, uh, zinc, vitamins A, D, and K, and then vitamin C, uh, so kind of what a lot of people were talking about for um, immune help. And so let's break down a couple of things. Well, vitamin C is the easiest one. We talked a lot about this. Vitamin C is water soluble. If you split the doses up throughout the day, you can probably absorb, you know, anywhere from, you know, 1500 to 2000 milligrams on the low end. If you split it up to, you know, 10,000 milligrams or more and some people, especially if they're sick, you don't want to take it all at once because vitamin C can give you diarrhea. And generally that's how you know you've taken enough vitamin C is your bowels get loose and you just back off. So vitamin C is fairly simple. It's not really going to hurt anything. Zinc is a good one to take early on, but remember what most of us were saying uh, over time was, if you're going to take zinc for a while, you should probably take it as part of a trace mineral uh, product. And so what, what I tended to do even through the early days of COVID, instead of just giving people zinc, is to have them steer them towards a uh, trace mineral product and uh, use the trace mineral product to get their zinc, but also to get other balancing minerals. <clears throat> the big one you have to be concerned about with zinc long-term if you're not taking it as copper. Now, if your copper levels were already high, sometimes doctors will actually give you zinc to lower your, your body copper levels. But what if your copper was not high? Well, copper and zinc have this balancing relationship. And so um, usually if you look at a multi-mineral, you may have 30 to 50 milligrams of zinc and then one or two milligrams of copper. So it's a tiny amount of copper. But long-term, if you've just been chugging down zinc and taking zinc, this would be a good time to switch over uh, to a multi-mineral that's got, you know, somewhere between 30 and 60 milligrams of zinc per dose. That might be two or three pills, but, uh, it, but also has a few milligrams of copper because long-term you do want them both. Short-term, not such a big deal. Then vitamin A, D, and K. Now these are not water soluble. These are fat soluble vitamins. Uh, and the, the fat solubles are vitamin A, D, E, and K. This person is taking all except vitamin E, so vitamin A, D, and K. Now, early on, probably vitamin D got the most attention, and a lot of us talked about uh, vitamin D. And certainly now there's research to show the lower your vitamin D levels are, the worse you're going to do in the hospital with COVID and all this other business. Um, one of the things that we talked about was, again, long-term vitamin D and vitamin K, both fat soluble, work better together. Now, a lot of people early on were just doing, you know, higher doses of vitamin D, 20, 50,000 IUs, maybe more. And I kind of said the same thing with that as I did with zinc, vitamin D being fat soluble is something that you're going to want to get tested and measured. And usually when you get your levels up, you can then lower your dose to keep them where they're at. So again, for the first, you know, one, two, three, four, five months or so, high doses of vitamin D, probably great during cold and flu season, 
uh, long term, you want to get it checked. And, and what I recommend taking is now easy, pretty easy to find are supplements that have vitamin D and K2 in them, vitamin K2, because vitamin D and K long term work together in the balance of uh, calcification in your body and a number of other maintenance uh, projects that they work on. Now, what about vitamin A? Now, vitamin A has two potential forms, although one is really the only vitamin A. But vitamin A, remember, is broken down carotenoid. So like you've heard of beta carotene probably. Carotenoids uh, are the, like the things in carrots and other stuff like that are these long double length vitamin A molecules. So like a beta carotene or other carotenoids are two vitamin A's put together. And then you go eat them, they go into your body and then your body has certain enzymes that will break the carotenoid in half and give you two units of vitamin A. Does it break all of them? No. Uh, and are some people, um, slow uh, genetically at breaking those things. Yes, there are some genes that you know, can slow you down there, et cetera. But let's say you're not getting it through carotenoids. So you're not eating, say, sweet potatoes or you know, carrots or other stuff like that, but you're getting a fat soluble vitamin A. That, those are retinoids. Okay, so carotenoids, water soluble, retinoids, fat soluble. So the fat soluble form of vitamin A are the retinoids and you'll see it, the, the, the drug or the supplement will start with RET for, for retinoid, retinol palmitate, retinol acetate, you know, uh, other forms of retinol are what you see there. So again, vitamin A is one of those things that you can become toxic with if you take too much because it's fat soluble, but just like we said with everything else, early in a cold and flu season, or if you're getting acutely ill, you, we give people extra for short periods of time. Now, vitamin A is a little harder to test accurately than vitamin D. Uh, but what we tend to recommend with people is if they're doing it for longer than say four to six months and they're taking vitamin A, you should really work with uh, somebody who can monitor your liver functions, uh, may want to do periodic vitamin A testing, although like I say, for uh, disease purposes, that it's, it has limited value, but you can do some of that. But also just somebody who's maybe going to take a look at everything overall. So if you're taking a lot of fat soluble nutrients, A, D, E, or K, in this person's case, A, D, and K, uh, and then you're taking imbalanced minerals, like just zinc alone, yeah, you're probably going to want to check in with somebody uh, and, and have that looked at. So I think that was a really good, you know, follow-up question because gosh, you know, we're, we're really not that far away from uh, coming up on two years uh, with all this. And there's been a lot of people who have talked a lot about nutrients and a lot of people taking nutrients, but again, over time, what you want to move towards is balance. Now, let's say you get, you know, a cold or, you know, you get COVID or you get any other acute problem. If you're working with somebody who, who, can help you with nutritional augmentation, what they're usually going to do is when you're acutely ill, they're going to raise these levels and, and have you take more during the acute illness and then back off over time. That's kind of the um, normal way that's done. Here we've had people trying to do, say, prevention or whatever, you know, for 16 months, um, 18 months, whatever it is now, um, you can get people into trouble sort of imbalancing things. So um, yes, you know, take a look at things, work with folks, uh, who know what they're doing. If you're going to do a lot of, especially fat soluble nutrients long-term, uh, get things looked at and, um, and you should be fine. But to you specifically, uh, who's just been on zinc, A, D and K, and then vitamin C, like I say, vitamin C, no big deal. Uh, but the zinc switch that over to a multi-mineral that's got some copper in it. Uh, and then vitamin A, D, and K, you know, be at least back off on the dose or work with somebody who can, who can guide you there. Now, had another question, and um, sorry, I've got, got more than one pile uh, with questions here, so I'll make sure I ask them in the right order or answer them in the right order. Um, yeah, so somebody... Um,
uh, somebody recently uh, was doing, it was a physician, they were doing a talk and they were talking about, okay, there's, there's technically a difference between the disease that we call COVID-19 and its inciting infectious trigger being SARS-CoV-2, the, the virus, right? And somebody watched this and said, could you elaborate on that? Because I, I got that they were saying, you know, the disease may have more facets and all that, but I thought, you know, this is a viral disease and the virus uh, that we uh, want to, you know, blame on COVID-19 is SARS-CoV-2, as we call it now. Why would there be a difference in uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and then, uh, and, and then COVID-19 as a disease? Well, that is a excellent question. And um, so thank you for asking. And also it, it's illustrated in something we all uh, have known about for decades at this point uh, that you can think of. And that is the difference between the disease AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, and an HIV infection. Okay? As you probably know, there are a lot of people who are HIV positive, but they don't have AIDS, the disease. So there are instances where we have infection and disease sort of having two different trajectories. Now, in the case of HIV and AIDS, there's a determination made <clears throat> when your uh, CD4 T cells reach a certain point uh, in suppression, because that's what the HIV infection does, and uh, then you start to have clinical manifestations of opportunistic infections and all manner of other problems that it is called acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Okay? So you're going from an infection that causes a problem to then picking up other disease states that go into the syndrome. What this doctor uh, who this person listened to was trying to get at is what they see in their practice is very similar where you have the inciting infection with SARS-CoV-2, but then you have this big thing called the disease of COVID-19. So what in the world does that mean? Well, if you look, there are uh, constellations of factors that make COVID-19 the disease less of a problem or more of a problem, okay? The way to think about that is if you have a SARS-CoV-2 infection and you give it to somebody who is otherwise healthy, uh, doesn't have uh, any silent clotting problems, their hormonal system is balanced, they don't have a lot of other infectious or immunologic problems, et cetera, you are more likely, not 100% guaranteed, but more likely to have a low level of disease state uh, in, in their COVID-19 disease experience. If you take SARS-CoV-2 and you put that into somebody who is weaker on many or all of those counts, so they have prior infectious disease that might be silent, they have some immune abnormalities, uh, they maybe have some of these other um, population study based things like you know low vitamin D and, uh, and diabetes and other stuff like that, um, et cetera, et cetera, their COVID-19 experience may be very big and robust and not very good. And so I do think it's a good way to think of it and look at it. And so the next follow-up that is either that person or somebody right next to them uh, asked was, well, all right, uh, I get, you know, okay, we trigger it with this virus over here, SARS-CoV-2, but then the disease can be a few things or a whole bunch of things put together. When you look at cases that don't go well, what are the whole bunch of things? So what are the worst things to have in there? Well, there's a number of things. The first thing would be any clotting problem because uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection changes your clotting quite handily. And with it uh, interacting with the ACE uh, receptors, uh, which are not, you know, not just in particular places, they're in, you know, very blood vessel dense areas, et cetera, you can have more problems. So any clotting issue that you do or don't know, you have a lot of people have genetic clotting problems that don't know it. And that can be more of a problem. 
The next thing that I see, which is universal in any research done about COVID-19 where they, where they track this, is 100% of research where they looked for co-infections, so more than just SARS-CoV-2, they find them. And the sicker you are, the more infections you're likely to have. Now, people will often say, um, how could you have infections that you don't know you have? That, that doesn't make any sense. Well, what you need to keep in mind is there are a lot of infections that a healthy, especially adult, can be exposed to. They can harbor small amounts, but maybe their immune system kind of has it uh, marginalized. There's a lot of viruses like this, et cetera. There's also some atypical lung bacteria that, you know, during cold flu season, people are coughing all over each other. And if you're sick, you tend to manifest it. If, if you're not sick, your immune system tends to take care of it. So a lot of us have these things sitting around that have not been a problem for us, or maybe haven't been a problem for years. When you <clears throat> light up your immune system, and the immune system now is, um, you know, on edge and it's fighting the SARS-CoV-2 and all this stuff. A lot of these latent resident viruses and bacteria will look around and say, well, no one's minding the store. They'll start to be opportunistic and replicate, which is what they do. So co-infections are massive, huge. Now there's also, if you unfortunately had some infections when you went into it, or you had an immune uh, disrupting either disease process, drug strategy or whatever. So you already have autoimmunity or you already have chronic infections or you're a diabetic with lowered immunity um, or you're on uh, immune modulating drugs that they decrease your immunity to certain uh, chronic infectious things, you are going to have not only SARS-CoV-2, but you're going to have a whole bunch of other infections, and those will often be what kill you if they're not addressed. So co-infections, so clotting problems and co-infections are probably two, two of the worst things. Along with clotting problems, I would put in any prior you know, cardiovascular disease, so uh, bad valves, heart failure, other things that disrupt the flow. Um, and then you know, when you get down below that, uh, the next layer of things that we see with people is that their uh, hormonal system, their endocrine system gets all out of balance. And that's natural with your, um, you know, with, with any bad infection. Uh, but if you have the SARS-CoV-2 part and then co-infections and some of these other problems, you're now, your immune system is battling a community instead of just one infectious thing. And so your endocrine system is having to respond to a much bigger uh, immune response. So when you think of that, um, you could see that, you know, while there certainly are people who are otherwise seemingly healthy, who get very sick or even die, uh, that generally speaking, the infection is one piece of a very big puzzle that is COVID-19 uh, that leads you to the disease called COVID-19. This is why then, um, and we just have a couple of minutes left, but this is why when you're looking at post-COVID illness, we often have to go back in and assess the patient and say, what of these areas is either not addressed enough or we didn't look at or, uh, or whatever. And so generally speaking, what we will do is we'll go and we'll take a look at all their hormone levels and see if those have shifted back to normal. Often they are not, that has to be addressed. We will look at infections that may still be there. Uh, so we'll often check for typical and atypical lung uh, infections, some of the chronic virus and other bacteria uh, and take a look at what's going on there. Um, we'll also look and make sure that something, you know, bad like a, like a, a hemolytic strep wasn't, you know, reactivated or, reanimated during the illness. Uh, we'll check on, you know, their, their inflammatory markers and clotting status like D-dimer and CRP and, and their, their clotting numbers, et cetera, and kind of base treatment on how bad that's going. Uh, and then any other thing which might include, you know, diet and 
sleep habits and all, all manner of other things that uh, may go on there. Well, I'm Dr. Paul Anderson, and it looks like we're just about out of uh, time for today. So today has been a, a, a topic of uh, catch up on uh, COVID-19 questions, immune questions, uh, and I tried to keep them all related to the immune system and COVID-19, but uh, there's some really great questions that people did send in. So um, if you're watching this on Facebook Live, thank you. Uh, you can look over and uh, subscribe and, and uh, check in to get notifications from CTR Radio. If you're listening on one of the pod burners, thank you. Uh, keep us on your favorites. And if you're listening on YouTube, please like, share, and subscribe. Dr. Paul Anderson for Medicine Health with Dr. Paul Anderson. And you can find all my links and all of this other stuff we talk about at dranow.com, D-R-A-N-O-W.com, D-R-A-N-O-W.com. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. And I'll see you on the radio in a week.